आज भारत के प्रतिष्ठा की तरफ से डॉक्टर डेविड ट्रॉली जिन्हें हम श्रीमानदेव शास्त्री जी के नाम से भी जानते हैं उनके बोलन के लिए हम सब एकत्र हुए हैं आप सबका स्वागत है सर रिक्वेस्ट यू प्लीज कम एंड गिव योर एड्रेस नमस्कार श्री गुरु जी नमहा वेलकम इट्स माय ऑनर टू बी विद यू एंड टू स्पीक अबाउट टू वेरी इंपोर्टेंट थिंकर्स गुरुस एंड इंटेलेक्चुअल्स ऑफ मॉडर्न इंडिया एंड आई थिंक a lot of what is going on in the country today a lot of the gains that are being made whether it is with the ram jambu issue or on many different levels are at least to some extent perhaps even to a great extent owing to their influence and their effect on the mind of the people and the human mind overall So what I would like to do is put this in a certain uh, perspective and start off with my own background and encounter with uh, Ram Swami and Sita Ram. Um, I was one of the uh, young Americans in the '60s who took up the causes of yoga and which moved me into Vedanta, which was more unusual at that particular time. And in the works of Sri Aurobindo, uh, particularly the Life Divine, I was able to gain an entry into the Indian mind, you could say, and even to some extent into the Vedic world. In fact, I was introduced to Vedic knowledge through his Sri Aurobindo's Instant Mystic Fire, and also Secret of the Veda. And in my studies, I, you know, I mentioned about M.P. Mandel and also Sri Ramayana. I came into contact, came into India, came into contact with these deeper streams. And in my study of the Vedas, I could easily see that the Vedas had been interpreted wrongly, misinterpreted at a historical and cultural level. And it wasn't far from that to see how India had been misinterpreted. In the 80s, I came into contact with RSS organizations in India. Quite by way of uh, coincidence, my main Ayurvedic uh, guru, Dr. Balabhashta, was a major journalist for uh, RSS in Mumbai and Pune. He was an editor of papers. He had written a number of books, including on Savarkar. Guru Gobind Singh, and so I was able to contact these Hindu groups directly before I had run into any negative propaganda against them. And uh, through that, I was I did eventually come into contact within a couple of three years with uh, these mysterious figures, Ramaswamy and Sita Ram Gobind, particularly around 1989. Uh, and of course, we have the Ram Jambu movement going on very strongly, and also with the writings of Paul Nadels, who was uh, working with them at that time, particularly on this issue. And then I believe it was probably around 1990 or 1991 uh, <coughs> that I met them in Delhi. And what I learned from them, my initial encounter, as you know, I was always being looked upon as someone who was far too crooked. And it was interesting to find people who would support that and also bring about a deeper understanding to that, and show a true and clear awakening of the human mind. I had already written books on the Aryan invasion and why it was wrong. I don't know if it's something that I read or that you can check out. But with them. I found that more direct encounter with the Hindu mind. 
And one thing I had always had trouble with in my discussions in India was this idea that all religions were the same. In fact, even some people have told me, oh, yes, you're coming in here very early to make you a better Christian. Um, I already knew that being a better Christian was not necessarily any way of becoming, having a deeper understanding of spirituality or the Hindu Dharma or anything else. So they presented a true understanding of Hindu thought, and particularly starting with Ram Shuru, there was a critique of the other religions from a Hindu way. This statement got you know, misinterpreted Sadhguru and misinterpreted as all religions are the same. It's caused a great deal of harm to the Indian psyche and to any man of life. Because if you in the beginning accept all religions as the same, then you disarm yourself. You don't have any critique against the missionaries, against all the distortions. You allow them to create a negative image of you, but you don't counter and you don't uh, go after their particular motives involved. Now, Ram Swarup and Sita Ram Gold were a very stark contrast in some ways. Even in terms of bodily size, Sita Ram Gold is so much more taller. And uh, Sita Ram Gold was much more outspoken. Ram Swarup was much more quiet had few words to say, and uh, yet his words had a tremendous impact. And what he brought about was a true and most authentic Hindu critique of the other religions. Not done out of spite, not done out of negativity, but done out of clarity of mind. In fact, he came from a Gandhian background, uh, he was the main voice in India criticizing communism, which in the 50s and 60s was almost elevated into a state religion in the country. And Sita Ram Gold himself had that conference, and it was Ram Swarup's influence that brought him over to the Hindu cause. He had also explored the different religions of the world. Both, I think both uh, he and uh, Sita Ram Gold had been involved with Swami Abhishek Bananda, uh, who was a French priest who had taken over a kind of quasi Hindu monastic uh, identity, but on probably at the time of the movement also. But they saw the contradictions and to some extent the hypocrisy in that movement that would outwardly use the symbols of Hinduism but never give up this converting of people to Christianity that would speak of the greatness of Hindu gurus extending to Ramana Maharshi, but not go against the agenda of the church involved. Uh, so he made efforts to communicate with all these people, and he also found out where they were coming from. Uh, he also then were engaged with some dialogue with the Sufis, and I remember. Uh, one remark that uh, I think it was that uh, Ram Suh, uh, made had a discussion of the unity of religions with the Sufis, and he said the Sufis said, All religions are one in Islam. That is what we need to accept. So they explored this, and Ram Suru brought out what is really uh, a tremendous and central insight that must be born in life. In Hindu and in Buddhist thought, there is, of course, a deep tradition of meditation and a study of levels and states of consciousness. There is not just the ordinary state of human mind and some state of self-realization, God-realization, whatever else you may want to call it. There are many other states of the human mind. So let me go into this uh, in some detail. Now, another thing that had attracted me about the Ram Sarup Sita Ram Gold, they were very closely connected to the teachings of Sri Aurobindo. And Sri Aurobindo had a much more Chakriya model for India, and he had this, uh, brought out this need for a deeper self assertion, deeper understanding, and reclamation of Vedas. One of the main disciples, uh, or at least followers of Sri Aurobindo, was another great thinker called 
straight on the Bible. And how you should tell them the Holy Spirit is uh, publishing his words, particularly it's important. They are the ones. And I also know uh, Anurang's uh, work. And so what Ramaswamy did, did with their work, he said, look, we have to use this critique of states of consciousness to examine Christianity and Islam. If we go back to the Yoga Sutras, Yoga is defined, of course, as Samadhi, Chitabhisthana. But Vyasa, commentating on the Yoga Sutras, says that Samadhi exists at all levels of the mind, all five Chitapunis. Yoga is only concerned with the Samadhi of the Aikadra and the Nirudabunis, the higher Bunis, but it exists on the other levels as well. And Swami Vivekananda made a very important statement. He said that an untrained person can fall into a state of samadhi for various reasons. They can have a tremendous influence upon the world, even, but there will be something tainted, mixed with rajas and tamas along with their experience that can cause a lot of confusion and even delusion as well. And Vivekananda then pointed out Muhammad as an example of that for all the good he did to humanity, and so also for all the problems that arose from uh, the forces that he set in motion, or the forces that came in motion out of as well. And if we look at the Western religions, we find that there is not that clarity of chitta shuddhi, purification of the consciousness. And there's not that understanding of states of consciousness. We have religions based upon faith and belief. In the Gita, speaking of Shraddha, uh, which we can roughly equate with faith, is also described as sattvic, rajasic, and tamasic. Faith is not always a good thing, there's blind faith, and faith does not put things beyond question. And as a little sidelight, um, I've been involved in a number of interfaith conferences, and uh, one thing I noticed is you cannot question anybody's faith, and that an interfaith conference is kind of getting together to affirm everyone's faith. So, uh, uh, joking that I've said that. Uh, an ordinary person may believe in one irrational faith, but in an interfaith movement, you have to accept everybody's irrational faith. So belief in the Yoga Sutras in that tradition is the kalpa, is an imagination. You know, we talked about nirga kalpa samadhi, because one has to move <laughs> all the imaginations and um, distortions. Now, looking at these states of consciousness then, uh, what is what kind of state of consciousness does as Mount Salut discusses Jehovah represent in the Bible? You have a jealous God, you have a God who gives commandments, who has chosen people. At least this is how it is most commonly understood. We are also confronted with a psychic formation that is not purely uh, subject. And in the Abrahamic traditions, there is not a concept of Atma, self, self-realization. There's a concept of Ishwara as a kind of cosmic word, but that Ishwara has, this can be a very partisan figure and can have some very uh, human emotions. Even the Jewish scholars today admit that and say that not only has humanity evolved over time, God is also evolved over time and has hopefully gotten better in the process. So when we promote uh, a belief, what are we doing? We want to convert and conquer the world. We want to save others. We want to save the world. These are motivations born of Rajabur, not suffer they are often connected to a militaristic brain of mind control, conquest. And so violence, suppression, uh, comes out of that rejecting of other forms of 
uh, belief. Now, one could say there are mystics in Christianity and Islam, Sufis, for example. Some have said that Jesus was a yogi. I'm not going to go into the uh, arguments involved there. Uh, but the fact is that the mindset, the psyche, the psychic influence that's coming out of these uh, traditions lacks proper introspection, to put it in my same diplomatic um, language. Instead of examining ourselves, there is a need to control and conquer the other. So Ramsu brought out this critique. He also explained the states of consciousness as per what Sri Anandam had brought out, Yoga Sutras, Vedas, Upanishads, all of that. But theology does matter. And if you're following a theology that does not have this deeper insight, way of self-knowledge, then that theology can set in negative forces. Because religion is a field where absolutes come into play. And if you make absolute what is relative, chosen people, uh, last prophet, only son of God, this language is itself ahamkarika. It has a certain egoistic trend to it. And then it develops an exclusivism. Uh, recently, I was writing something about uh, multiculturalism. That's also something I think uh, Bill Ross would really find very interesting. Multiculturalism, when you bring in an exclusive culture, you're actually destroying multiculturalism. Like an ecosystem in which you bring in an inappropriate a species that destroys the rest. So, but modern Hinduism has been lacking, along with its critique of other religions, is the data, you know, a deep level of discernment based upon the teachings. And it'd be a, a, a good and a bad thing happen in that you have the independence movement. The independence movement came out of was essentially a Hindu awakening, whether it was through Ramakrishna, whether it was through Swami Dharananda, Saraswati, and so forth. But when it became a political force, it had to then give respect to all the other religions. So any critique of the other religions came to an end. And at the same time, the other religions' critique of Hinduism could continue. Your demons, your kafirs, your idolaters, your uh, animists, you worship gurus and godmen, all these uh, different things. So, he brought that discrimination and discernment back. And of course, it does raise questions. Uh, just as calling Hindus heathens or Kafirs raises questions. Even when, from a Hindu point of view, we may uh, question the level of consciousness or awareness of Muhammad or anyone else in this uh, tradition. Raises questions. At the same time, the Hindu tradition is not aggressive. But at the same time, it has the right to defend itself. If you are seeking to convert us and our children, we have a right to question your motives, your theologies, and even your leaders. Because you're the one that's saying, we have to do this because our leader, our savior, our prophet, has said that all human beings must do this. So this science of consciousness is not there in the other religious traditions of the world. And interestingly, I also studied uh, Buddhism to some degree. And I had a friend who was a professor of Buddhism at San Francisco State College. And one of the texts he was going through was called the Sharangama Sutra. And the Sharangama Sutra also outlines the different faults, samadhis, or illusory states of consciousness that can occur. He actually came from a Jewish background, but he made the remark that this sounds like some of the other religions of the world that outside of the uh, traditions. So then there has been this study that's gone on from the, the psychology of prophet or in fact the psychology has been used to approach uh, religious theories throughout the world that wouldn't necessarily endorse Western psychology in that regard. Uh, but there is a need to look at the states of consciousness involved. And if we want an authentic dharma, there has to be a proper understanding of moksha, yana, paramatma, 
jiva, karma, and be. But some people say all religions are the same. Uh, but then all religions doesn't, don't have karma. Is karma something dispensable that uh, you can make? And we have the other problem, which they also challenge, of using this Western theological terminology to approach the Hindu Dharma. For example, some people were saying that at the Kuma Mela, Hindus were taking bath, a bath in the river to get rid of their sins and achieve salvation, possibly for heaven who knows. So this terminology has also served to disarm the Hindu world. Now I'm not saying we should be bigoted, I'm also not saying that freedom of religion should not be bigoted. But we require the same debate or discernment relative to religion and spirituality, even more so, because this is a crucial area of absolutes, as we do for any other aspect of human life, whether it's politics, whether it's economics, whether it's the people we need to have all of that, and Bromsu uh, and Sita Bromsu. Back. Now, it's also interesting to know that uh, when we make all religions the same, we also we not only disarm the Hindus, we also discredit the pagan, native, and indigenous traditions throughout the world, who are similarly being attacked and targeted for conversion, and have been for centuries, uh, just as. Uh, Hindu thought has been denigrated as something backward, primitive, and idolatrous, even though they're borrowed from it. Uh, so, too, that happened throughout the world. Uh, recently, we were in uh, Mexico, and you know, when the Spanish came, they burned all the books of the Mayas, except the three. And in those three books, we find the most sophisticated astronomy. Uh, cycles and periods of Mercury, the most sophisticated astronomy, much of which they didn't even have in Europe at that particular time. And yet we were told that they were uh, primitive uh, people. We also have an awakening of pagan thought and groups throughout Europe, including whether it's Celts, whether it's the Germanic groups, whether it's the uh, Slavic groups, uh, Lithuanians, so many groups are doing that. And we say all religions are the same, we also discredit them. So Ram Sarup had an outreach to the pagan traditions. He had a dialogue with them. And he also encouraged them to study and be faithful to their traditions and develop their own critiques of Christianity. You know, we are all kind of in the world, we've been in awe of Western civilization over the past few centuries, right? Mainly because of science, uh, democracy, uh, certain aspects of art and technology. And yet if we look at historically, all these main trends that we admire in Western thought had pagan roots. They weren't products of the Bible. They were imposed by the Christian church. They came out of the Greco-Roman background or even the Celtic background prior to uh, Christianity. And even what we call philosophy and theology and mysticism in both Christianity and Islam has strong pagan roots. Catholic theology goes back to say, goes back to Aristotle. The mysticism goes back to Plato and uh, Plotinus. Or there was a figure named Apollonius of Chiron, who uh, is sometimes confused with Jesus. Uh, he per performed miracles, and he was historically known to have gone to India and come back. Uh, recently, someone asked one of the few Christian theologians, I don't think it was the Pope, but somebody else, that, uh, what do you think of Aristotle, who was a pagan? He said, no, he was not a pagan, he was a premature Christian. <laughs> so, Ramsu also reached out to that community and helped survive that community, and give them a sense of support from India. You have to understand that Hinduism is the third largest of the religions of the world uh, today, only after Christianity and Islam. It is also the largest of the non-Abrahamic traditions, the non-monotheistic uh, traditions. 
And so it carries on the same aspiration of the pagan and also the indigenous uh, peoples. In New Mexico, we also have a lot of the Native Americans there, including the Navajos. We have some Navajo friends. They live in a village of about 3,000 people. They still don't have adequate water and electricity because they're Native Americans, even though they live in the United States. And so I asked them, do you have our missionaries targeting me? And he says, well, in our community of 3,000 people, there are 19 different missionary organizations active even uh, today. They're targeting their children. And we do not always know how to counter them because they claim to represent a more enlightened, a more humane, compassionate, philosophical uh, tradition. Of course, we see that going on in India uh, today. So Ramsuru and Sitara not only defended those traditions, they also raised the critique against the missionaries and the Islamists uh, in India at a time when it wasn't politically correct to do so. I don't know if it's politically correct to do so uh, today. But we need a free and open uh, discussion. And if we look at some of the evangelical groups with their fake miracles and their kind of uh, healing and rolling on the floor and all the other things that they do, that's another, can also be easily understood according to this other states or altered states of consciousness in which you are motivated by a belief rather than an open pursuit of truth. If you're motivated by a belief, then you're always going to do whatever you do, the mind can pay any trick to promote and uphold that uh, belief. So over that whole era of all religions being equal or the same, Hindus were disarmed. And Hindus had to be rearmed again. And Ramsuru and Sri Tarango, you have to remember, were a couple of individuals. They did not have the support of a vast organization. In fact, they did not have political support. In fact, there's a lot of political media and social influences against them just for raising questions. As you, as you well know, that uh, uh, when Sita Rango uh, produced his book on the Hindu temples, quoting Islamic records, he was called bigoted for uh, showing what they had said. Uh, he was what? He was arrested. He was, uh, uh, you know, he had a lot of trouble he was put into just for exposing what the truth uh, was. And that took a lot of personal courage. And also, they did so without having any great financial resources uh, behind them. In fact, they told me the story once there was a lady, I think it's Mary, named this Miranda from the week. Uh, one of the Indian writers of the left. I think she's still uh, fairly active today. Uh, so when we started writing these books in the 90s, she, they started attacking us. After I wrote uh, uh, one short book I did for Voice of India, it was Lifted the Great Nation, which was a summary of the uh, challenges to that long view that we had brought out. And I found that uh, right away I was labeled in the week by Ms. Miranda as a well a well known fascist William Drawing. Of course they didn't get my first name right, but I was a well known fascist. So we see of course RSS was dealing with that through all the all those periods of being called Gandhi killers, Savarkar being a fascist, and every possible distortion that had no basis in actual fact, but could be sustained because of a certain political media and academic uh, support. So they bore the brunt of that attack at a time when very few people were writing. One thing I can say today quite happily is we have a lot of good writers, a lot of young writers who are following the same themes that Ramsuru and uh, Sita Ramgo put in motion. I won't mention all of their names. I have to be careful with names because some will feel like that's somebody else out. But we have a new generation that way. And we also have a social media that can challenge the mainstream media, which can put out, which had the better monopoly. They had whatever distortion they wanted as truth. 
We also have alternative movements in academia. Academia also remains a realm in which these uh, false views have been enshrined. For example, we know how in accounts of history books that Christianity and Islam come off a lot better sound than Hinduism or even Buddhism, even in these textbooks of uh, India. One of the things I can feel proud about uh, in my life is that uh, we have been challenging this Aryan question. And someone I knew had been on a plane with Romila Popper, and she was discussing how these writers from Voice of India had ruined her life. <laughs> so there was that impact. So Nirananda came to Voice of India and asked, you know, where are you giving all your money and how do you function and what do you do? She thought that there was some tremendous resources behind it. It was the strength of the ideas and uh, the insights. It wasn't just a question of having a big popular um, publishing company with wide outreach. It was uh, mouth to mouth and smaller groups and, and to some extent uh, influential people. Another group I was, have been closely connected to is the Hinduism Today Monastery and publication coming out of Hawaii in the United States. They have some of the best books on what is Hinduism and also uh, they have an ongoing magazine, now they have very good videos. For example, one simple thing they did relative to this, all religions are the same, they simply did a uh, comparison. They had a page for each religion, what it believes in, what its values are, what its ideas are, its founders, etc. So you just read through and see how much the same they actually are. And I have to tell you that one of their main inspirations was Ram Suru and Sita Ram Go. They wrote special articles on them, including um, mm -hmm. at their uh, passing. Main Guru Shivaya Subramunya Swami. Uh, and they have been the dominant voice of Hindus in the West. And they have kept up very closely with this critique of other religions because they have to see that. The young Hindu in the West is going to be confronted with dozens of uh, attempts to convert them uh, throughout their lives. And uh, even, it's very interesting, you know, I live in uh, New Mexico and we have a house up in the mountains, a relatively remote area. And once in a while, some missionary groups have come uh, we just didn't ignore them. But one morning, I went down to my gate, we have a gate so people can go and I found from the Jehovah's Witnesses a whole set of literature in Hindi on why Hindus should become Christians. And this is in the uh, United States. So don't think that you are making inroads with these people by not having a critique in return. I tried to be friendly, or I tried to be open. I said, look, let's, uh, spirituality should be like a science. Law of karma and heaven and hell cannot both be true. And of course, they will agree, but they will have a different understanding of it. Uh, we have to introduce uh, introspection. And now, of course, in India, too, we also have the adaptation or the culturalization process going on. And Ram Swaroop and Sita Ram spoke about that very clearly in the beginning. That is when groups, particularly the Christian and Catholic Church, adopts the symbols or terms of another religion, but for conversion purposes. Going in the South today, recently in Kerala, we have the stumpers in front of the church. Uh, they will do art. You may find uh, Mother Mary with Ganesha. You may have the Aeon uh, Jesus. They may say, Jesus is a yogi. If you become a Christian like us, you become a better yogi. Uh, so they were, they were using that terminology, even Vedanta. I was telling some uh, Hindus that, you know, why are you using the term God? It's better to use the term Paramatma. Uh, a couple of years ago, we were, uh, we were staying in the hotel, and they were having, they were having a, a Christian group was having a mass outside. Instead of using the term God, they used the term Paramatma. Although, of course, they were using it in a different way than the Hindu teachings of the Vedanta would have, because of course for them, Atma is not a name of the divine. Atma self is not something they recommend. So that acculturalization we expose, 
And then, and then all these problems happen. There was another friend, uh, this uh, uh, Swami, uh, we call him Ishwar Chana, uh, Devananda, was in a debate with uh, Father B. Griffiths in, in South India, who was taking over the Shanti Ketan Abhishekananda. And he had Om on his cross, and he had, had Om on the cross that he was had. And he was also still converting Christians. So the Swami, who was actually a Canadian, criticized him for that and said, You have no right to take over Hindu symbols. He says, No, Om is not a Hindu symbol, Om is universal. He didn't do excuses, so I have right to use it too. And they had a debate, and in that debate, uh, uh, which went to the media, the Hindu Swami was said to be uh, intolerant and bigoted for questioning the Christian monk for using all on the cross. And they never mentioned the conversion going on in that name. So Ram Sarup and Sita Ram Goh also exposed that whole process of acculturalization. Just because these groups are taking on Hindu terms and practices, that doesn't mean they're honoring. In fact, it was also said that they wanted to do with the Hindus what they had done with the ancient Greeks. Take over their philosophy, their art, their mysticism, but use it for the church, and then eventually, of course, eliminate it all together. Now in South Asia, we have uh, Christian Bharatnatyam, we have uh, Christian uh, Ayurveda, we have uh, bhajans where Krishna's name is removed and Jesus is used uh, instead. That whole process of acculturalization is going on. And there we can also see the alliance of the anti Hindu forces. South India is the only place I know in the world where you, where you can see communists, Islamists, evangelical Christians, and Dravidian nationalists all together. As if they share a common religion or ideology, what they have in common is this wanting to remove the Hindu. But because the Hindu culture is so strong, they have to try to subvert it. <coughs> you have huge seminary groups in Bangalore that are studying Vedanta and all the Advaitic gurus, not because they want to uh, follow that tradition, but because they want to learn that language to better convert. Hindus. This is an old practice. Jesuits always did that wherever they went. And then what we have to understand is that in the level of philosophy and theology, none of these groups can compare with the Vedanta. Logically, experientially, they can. So they have to create distortions or beliefs, or they have to create social benefits, money, schooling, for your children, all these other factors. So Ram Shulup and Sita Ram Goh exposed that. And relative to Islam, they warned about Islamic terrorism before it had totally raised its face as an, ex as an outcome of the uh, exclusivist way of thought. And uh, it's interesting, um, another friend of ours who worked mostly with uh, Voice of India was Anas Rajaram. And one book he found was by Brigadier General Malik of the Pakistan Army, I think it was called The Islamic Art of War. And it had a foreword by General Zia. And in the foreword, they explained that the most important thing to start off with in war was terrorism, because once you've undermined the confidence of the masses, then they're more easily easy to <coughs> attack and uh, overcome. Uh, so, and then we have the historical thing, right? It started off with uh, this whole question, our invasion, and all of that. And Voice of India then also became the main company that was bringing out books like Elston and Talibari addressing these issues as well. Uh, why was this issue so politicized? I always wondered that. And the reason is very simple because this historical issue sets the foundation for interpreting the whole history of India so, and the culture. So after independence, uh, we had the old independence movement, the old uh, Gandhi Congress was thrown out, 
the independence leaders were discredited or forgotten. And we had the new Nehruvian Congress who outsourced its intellectuals to the Marxists, who then rewrote history to undermine the sense of any cultural identity or continuity in the Indian context. And Ramsarup and Sita Ramkulo also wrote in a way to affirm that continuity and expose those distortions. They did a little more work in the Indian era, where we had all these groups like the Delhi Sultanate, besides uh, the Mughals, whose work was to destroy the civilization. It was had to, to destroy and convert. It was, it was totally out in the open, and yet it was being covered over uh, from the um, historical standpoint. And we have also seen that uh, discourse uh, turning in our favor, whether it was the discovery of the Saraswati River. And recently, moving kind of a little bit beyond the topic, I've been in dialogue with the geneticists working in the Niraj uh, Rai and Vishinde, and they have now done extensive genetic work on hundreds of skeletons throughout India and at different periods of time. Not all of this work has yet been released. Some of it has come out relative to Rocky Guy, but it can now be genetically proved, even the Western geneticists are accepting it, that you had a continuity of the same populations uh, in India throughout history. There's no evidence of steppe people, either before 1500 BC or even after it. Their, their uh, indications are, are very small. Uh, and, and the oldest population is actually from Gujarat. We seem to be a little bit more from, from that part of the country. And more recently, they are discovering the imprint of the Indic populations in Iran, eastern Iran, more than 4,000 years ago, along with from up an artifact showing that the Indian civilization moved out is out of Indian theory. Conrad Els has also emphasized that quite a bit. I also emphasize that. That's been a contribution to uh, the inspiration of also Sita Ram Go. So that is going on. We've also found the oldest chariots in the world in Sonali, uh, not far from Delhi, going back more than uh, 4,000 years, made of copper. Our chariots not there. And the geneticists have also been working on the animals and uh, the, their contribution. And they found that the Brahma bull, the zebu, was the main animal used in Iran some uh, more than 4,000 years ago. And that the Indian horse is genetically connected to the Arabian horse with 34 ribs. This is a genetic statement. Uh, and it cannot be equated with the Central Asian horse. In fact, so far, exactly where and when the Central Asian horse came is not known in terms of the uh, genetic record. So a lot of these uh, historical markers have also moved in terms of our favor. Of course, the old geology and size of the river, that is a bit more uh, well known. So what's been amazing about the work of Caesar on Gold and Long Salute is the different areas that they've covered at these critical edge of hidden thought in the late 19th, I should say the late 20th uh, century. And its legacy today, because all these movements, all these improvements, all these thoughts are going forward. But strangely, and perhaps um, uh, we can understand it in mind, a lot of the young people don't know about voice in India. They have received ideas from me, from Alex, from Sadio, from, from Michelle Benino, from Raji Malhotra, and they think that these ideas came from the people they read. They don't realize that these ideas have a history that would not have been possible without a prior work. Um, and along with uh, Voice of India and Ramsa Lucy and I also was working very closely with RSS on many different levels that had supported this work on uh, all the different subjects involved. Uh, recently, in March, I was I was in Ahmedabad. I gave a, a talk there. And we, I was there with Kumar Bhagwa, and we released a book of Rana Swaru, uh, along with uh, uh, my foreword in Hindi on all these different issues. 
Uh, seek around goals is a little more well known. It still should be much more well known than it is, but Ram's Farouk's work is not so well known. There are four volumes of his collective works that are very important. He wrote on Hinduism, he wrote on Hinduism and monotheistic traditions, he wrote on um, uh, words, revelation, names of gods, and he also wrote on yoga and uh, meditation. He set up this metaphysical foundation of the Hindu movement quite uh, clearly. He also wrote on some of the more mundane social issues. Sikharam Gaul will mainly on the religious issues, but also to some extent the political issues. And he was the one who really galvanized the Hindus against this uh, missionary influence. Catholic ashrams. But again, they came to the beginning to establish dialogue and discover that there was no dialogue going on there um, at all. So it's very important that their legacy is preserved and that they are honored when uh, Ram Saruk uh, passed away. I mean, it's called the Great Rishi by Anas and Sikh leaders. And I know their work has been widely studied. RSS throughout the world has been ordered in the study of uh, these particular books. Uh, at the same time, I think there needs to be a greater study of the works. And I think the Ramsarut's books in particular need more examination today to create that broader philosophical, metaphysical foundation. But it's essential. That there is a Hindu critique of the religions of the world, and also who has a Hindu critique of Christianity and Islam. That is a very good place uh, to uh, start. There's always the famous quote of Mahatma Gandhi when asked about Western civilization, he said it would be a good idea. And the point is that there also needs to be a Hindu critique of Western civilization. And both the good and the bad. Because Western civilization does not have the science of consciousness. It regards the intellectual, uh, who is often a logistic character, as the ultimate spokesperson, who may be a genius, or maybe someone who has some scientific insight or today attempting that. But without having that deeper Rishi vision, how can humanity be guided? We could say that also um, has brought that uh, Rishi vision back. There is benefits to Western science and technology, but there are also problems involved, and new critique is necessary relative to the information technology. We don't have time to address that. It's another topic, but essentially, the mechanical way of life, the control by drugs and media is going to a big way in the Western world. It's coming here also. And the cultural war against Hinduism continues. Ram Salut and Caesar Ram Gold will address that clearly. From their time and their place, you know, more work going on, but it's still continuing and creating new avenues and heroes in various media and commercial levels. Uh, and so we might say that uh, Ram Sukup and Sitaran Go were pioneers of this new awakening. And it's coming to the fore today. We also see we have won significant victories like Ayodhya and even. Kashmir, <laughs> education system needs us more fundamental overall. Academia and media have made some changes, but more needs to be done on those in those areas. Then there's need to be political. Those are the least political of any of the business of the world. Politics is the uh, we might say the currency. If you don't vote, you don't you don't get anything. You don't you're not rewarded for uh, not uh, so it's very important that we honor these things and we go back to their work and we encourage the young people to study their work and the writers today to credit them for the insights that come along. They were also not the first, there was Arvinda, there was uh, Anurvan, there was uh, Samartha Ramdas. People forget that, Ram, that the uh, guru of Shivaji uh, was a great advisor, advisor they found to who also set up all these Hanuman wrestling and uh, gyms throughout Maharashtra to make people strong. That Kshatriya Dharma needs to come back. 
this uh, seat around when I was in uh, England and uh, London and uh, throughout England in 1996. I've done some tour. I just talked to this uh, seat around the distance. And he said, What are you talking about? I've got you. This is a natural chapter, right? And he said, We have to emphasize that. The intellectual has to also be a chapter, and that the first level of defense for a country is the intellectual, and it has been deprived of that by its Peruvian academia. Uh, uh, so, as I said, Citroen Gold is the foremost intellectual chapter in uh, uh, modern India. Uh, he spoke very boldly. In fact, some people found these a little bit offensive, as I said. I was asking why he speaks so boldly. He says, today, if I don't, they will not listen. And then we will be heard. Ramsu took over the role of the Rishi, the seer, the guide, the one who was applied. But he also saw and the nature of the influences that they influenced many people. Including my friend Lokesh Chandra, one of the four volumes of Ram Swoop's collected works was uh, put together and edited by uh, Lokesh uh, Chandra. Their influence has gone very far, in spite of the lack of our uh, support or resources to uh, uh, So I'm very happy that we are at least addressing that to some extent today. Uh, and I know our assessment. Has created some movements through Ramsar for at least um, the movement in India. Uh, but we need more of that, and we need uh, to produce more thinkers like this and also honor that heritage because it's not going to come along with that intellectual defense. Swami Chinmayananda was doing it, and Swami Dhananda was doing it, but most of the groups didn't do it. It was caught up in the South and down. So Baba, the intellectuals were compromised by Marxism and by wanting to be in favor of a monopolistic dynasty. So if they hadn't served that crucial role of the intellectual defense of Hinduism, this whole modern people may not have occurred, or it may have occurred much more um, slowly. So we have to honor these pioneers uh, and continue their legacy which means we do have to ask critical questions. We have to be willing to challenge distortions. And uh, we cannot just pretend that everything is going to be okay because Congress is with us or you know, Gurus are with us or Shiva is with us. We ourselves must act. And today, the decisive turn, I would say, has been made with the Modi government. But we need to push it further. There's a generational change that's required, an institutional change that is required, a change in the mindset when there is still tremendous resistance from overseas forces because all the other countries in the region would prefer a weaker India and a weaker India. So naturally, why do you want to have the world's the second largest country in the world in population strong? So that we must remember. And we must not give up our vigilance. We must remain kind and considerate, but we must hold to the truth, even if it is unpleasant, whether for ourselves or even unpleasant for others. And we must promote the culture. The culture is what is surviving all, all, all the festivals, all the rituals, all the temples. Supporting is very important. We will go into the details of that now. We also need to teach the Vedantic philosophy to everyone. It can be a Vaita, it can be Vaita, that's not the issue. It is the foundations that are necessary to understand the kind of negative uh, theology. We need to criticize this whole conversion based uh, movement. Uh, you're certainly free to follow whatever religion you want, but when you're seeking to convert us, then we are not going to uh, challenge you and expose your motivation and the unspiritual. Approach. Uh, right, there are two other missionaries in India today. They're coming on tourist visas. That also needs to be exposed. So, in other words, even though a decisive turn has been made, much more work needs to be done. Never underestimate your enemy and also recognize the outside forces that are supporting um, these groups uh, in the country. But I think 
the long run, we say Satya may be jayati, that is in the world of eternity. <coughs> it's also in the long term uh, in history. We have to be there for the long run. And now that we have the proper intellectual and spiritual foundation, we have to share. And that we know all the children to know the basic principles that Ram Swarov shared about critique of Christianity. Because now, so when someone asks them, you know, what do you believe in, you can also reply uh, strongly. People are always asking, what is your one book? So if we are not people who live in the library, we would never go back to one book. Only uh, we need to address these particular issues. So uh, with these comments, I will bring my uh, lecture talk uh, to a close. But in summary, uh, this legacy should be preserved and shared. And maybe reorganized when you need certain concerns and uh, forms, and also correlated other teachings and critiques. Follow the example of Shankar Chai, for example. You travel all over India, but you also get a critique of all the uh, systems of thought. And make sure that we have the intellectual activity to deal with the media. Now, one level, Sitar Rambo and Ramsar Ruth. They may emphasize the English medium because that was the intelligence that they had to address. That was the medium they had to address. It's important that goes on, but it's also important that these ideas are brought into uh, local languages uh, as well. So I thank the India Policy Foundation for organizing this.